Welcome back, everybody. We're going to get going. Um, next up, we have Mike Reese, who is uh, one of the locals here and the organizer of the Utah Valley meetup. Um, because after Brandon bailed and went to Austin, I didn't want to do it again, so we made Michael do it. Uh, but uh, Michael is a, a good friend of mine. He actually he lives in my neighborhood. Um, you know, we go to church together. We're home teaching companions. It's it's pretty awesome. It's pretty epic. So I'm super, no nepotism involved at all uh, on Michael speaking. But uh, actually, it was kind of a, uh, Michael was our last, our alternate. And then it was quickly, a, oh, can you do the full 45 minute, give a whole session? And he's like, sure, I have no stress at work. It's totally fun. <laughs> so, um, Michael, I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be fun. It's all about uh, robots and junk like that. So. All right, it's always good to be known as the B-string, <laughs> try and uh, carry that tradition on. Uh, so as Mike talked about, um, I, I today really just want to talk about robots and fun stuff. Uh, I really hope that no one gets anything useful out of this presentation at all. You shouldn't be able to tell your boss about anything you learned during the next 45 minutes. Uh, and uh, I'll make that as true as I can. So, uh, yeah, stuff like this. There's going to be lots of this. Uh, quick introduction, like Mike said, I'm Mike Reese. I go by MMM Reese pretty much everywhere that I happen to be on the internet. Uh, I work at MX, um, but my real calling in life is making babies that have ridiculously good hair. Uh, I don't have any stickers, but if you want to come swap some pictures of babies, just be prepared to be embarrassed, because my babies are really good looking. Uh, <laughs> So this is Winston, uh, takes after me. Thank goodness one of them did. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here at the last Mountain West Ruby Conf. Um, I've gotten to speak here once before, uh, and it is a bittersweet thing as it is for many of us here. For me, I was remembering the other day, the first time I attended a UROG meetup. Uh, I was still a student at BYU at the time, uh, and I remember like the week before, I had just gotten Ubuntu running on my ThinkPad laptop, and I thought that I would be one of the cool kids when I showed up at a UROG event with a Ubuntu laptop. And instead, I got there and everyone had a Mac. And I felt so insecure about my hardware. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know it, but I was just a hipster ahead of my time. You know? now, now it's like all about you know, overthrowing our corporate overlords and, and, and using Ubuntu would be cool again now. But I was, I was too ahead, too far. Uh, and specifically within this uh, UROG universe, I really want to call out Mike. As he said, we uh, have had plenty of time together. Uh, I've never gotten to cry into his shoulder like Brandon mentioned, but I'm, gonna, I'm actively looking for a reason to start crying, if anyone wants to suggest one. Uh, and some of you may not know, but Mike is a secret millennial. I suspect that he's actually made up of a group of little rascals hiding <laughs> underneath a trench coat. Uh, or perhaps Mike would prefer the metaphor of a group of ponies hiding underneath the trench coat. <laughs> uh, if you don't know, this is actually why Mike really loves to troll everyone so much, because he's actually just a kid, and so he likes to make fun of all the rest of us adults for the adult things that we do. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much all you need to know about him. And also, I wanted to call it really quick. I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but Tender Love at this, uh, this conference has been looking really buttoned up. He's... He's looking almost enterprisey, dare I say, uh, like wearing a jacket and a, and a button-up shirt. I was, I was thinking, you know, that maybe we'd get the weird hat tender love, uh, or perhaps the wizard in a bathrobe tender love, <laughs> or uh, maybe colonial tender love, or I was really, really hoping to get the Hansi Unabomber tender love. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, none, of, none of those things really panned out. And so, uh, uh, you know, it made me think he sort of looks kind of like a professor. And so I'm going to propose that we call him for the remainder of uh, this last Mountain West Ruby Conf. He should be known as Professor Love.
Uh, and that was my best attempt at an emoji representation of that name. <laughs> All right, so um, as I talked about at the beginning, uh, when I was thinking about this talk and when Mike was like, hey, can you do a 20-minute talk? Hey, just kidding, can you do a 30-minute talk? Hey, just kidding, can you do a 45-minute talk? I was thinking about the useful and the fun aspects of what I wanted to talk about, uh, and then I just threw away the useful part um, and decided this should just be about fun. Um, and this mattered to me because, uh, similar to uh, one of our earlier talks from Jameson, uh, I've gone through some ups and downs in my career of times when I get home at night and I play hard with my kids, but as soon as they're asleep, I'm just like, boom, got to get on that GitHub, got to get some PRs going, pad those stats, and I'll just be really into it. And then a month will go by, and really all I want to do is like watch reruns of Psych. Uh, <laughs> And, and I've been on that roller coaster. Um, and recently, uh, one of the things that has, for me, been a really good way to reconnect with the fun of programming is robots. A lot of, a lot of people I know, they got into programming because they wanted to make video games. Uh, and that's a really fun experiment. Um, but for me, I've always wanted to make robots. That's always what it was about for me. Uh, I wanted to make robots that did cool things like bust out some sweet dance moves. I wanted to make robots that would fight each other and stand up really awkwardly. <laughs> I wanted to make robots that could make some sweet jams. Uh, actually, I have to just comment, like, this robot in the top right here, what? I don't understand his job in this robot band, because he's not playing any instruments. I thought maybe he's a backup dancer, but it doesn't move. It just has giant saw blades on its head. Maybe that's all you need to do to be in a robot band. Uh, it seems like this might be the nickelback of robot bands. <laughs> Uh, it'd also be cool if I could make a robot that would just raise its arms, but somehow look really scary and intimidating in the process of doing that. Um, and finally, if one day, <laughs> one day I could make a chef bot, and it would make some sweet farm-to-table health Oreos, very finely diced, uh, and really be dedicated to that job, it would, it would just bring a lot of happiness into my life. Um, so I'm not there yet. Uh, chef... Chef Oreo is not, not ready quite yet for demo day. Uh, but um, also, as I was preparing this talk, and uh, actually just earlier today, I heard from one of the other attendees about a place that's here nearby in the area. There's a little museum just down the street called God Hates Robots. Um, a little intimidating. Maybe I should have thought of this before I decided to give my talk on robots. Uh, for anyone who's out of town, though, actually this other place right here, Tin Angel, super good food, pro tip. Go eat dinner there tonight uh, and save room for panna cotta at the end. Um, but yeah, I didn't realize this was like a thing. This is, I, I really didn't know that. Uh, thro it really throws a wrench into my understanding of things. Um, and I'm feeling pretty, uh, pretty intimidated. So hopefully not very many of you have similar feelings about robots in this crowd. Um, so the robot that I set out to build, um, the main goal that I had for my robot was I wanted it to be a robot that was built to interact with people. So a lot of the robots that I had experimented with in the past, they tried to accomplish some sort of practical job, like vacuuming a floor or carrying something from one place to another. And they sort of tried to do that with the minimal, minimal amount of interference from humans as possible. Um, and this time, that's not the robot I wanted. I wanted a robot sort of that would feel like R2-D2. It would sort of like, when it ran into a good guy, it would sort of make happy beeps at them and maybe throw a lightsaber out of its head. Uh, and if it met a bad person, it would somehow know that and kind of like back up and make like little nervous beeps or something like that. Um, this is also not totally in the realm of feasibility along with Oreo bot yet, but uh, this is what I was setting out to do. So I began by asking myself the question, as a Rubyist, what are the skills that I can fall back on? What are the skills that we as a community have uh, acquired over our history? So right off the bat, Rubyists are really good at taking things and gluing them together. We may not understand how all the pieces actually work. We may not be worrying about the failure scenarios that they introduce. We just glue them together and make mashup websites, and this is something we're really good at. So that seemed like a good place to start. Uh, and so for me, what this meant is I didn't want to get bogged down in the details of like, how many things am I going to have to order off of SparkFun and Adafruit before I actually have something that moves? Uh, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time buying resistors and capacitors and doing soldering. Um, so I found this amazing platform, and I highly recommend it. If you are someone who wants to play with robots, uh, the company that makes Roombas, they sell this project called iRobotCreate. Uh, they're on the second version of it, 
Um, as you can see, it comes with like batteries included, motors already set up, it has infrared sensors, bump sensors, cliff sensors, wheel encoders, buttons, uh, it even can tell you the, the charging state of the battery and how full it is. Um, this is a whole bunch of stuff that if you tried to build from scratch, it just takes several months of learning. Um, and that, that wasn't the part of the project that I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on its behavior. Uh, so this was a good place to get started. And also, um, I didn't really want to go learn more C. Uh, C is a great language, and I'm sure it would do a magnificent job of running this robot, but uh, it would just be a lot of new tools and a lot of new gotchas. Uh, and so a great thing about projects like the Raspberry Pi is that it has an SSH daemon that runs when you first boot it up. And I know how to do that. I know how to SSH to things, and I know how Linux, Linux processes work and how they can communicate. Um, and this just does all of those things. It's sort of like having your own mini cloud on a, on a card. And uh, so that is loads and loads of fun uh, and saves an enormous amount of time. Uh, and then I thought some more about what it is that Rubyists are really good at. Uh, this is probably a good time to, to note that uh, I decided to open a GIF consultancy. If you need the next great GIF for your presentation, I'm available for hire immediately. Uh, and so since, since we're very good at grabbing snippets of code off of Stack Overflow and mindlessly copying and pasting them into our projects, it seemed like a good place to go as well. Uh, so I, go, I went to RubyGems, and one of the really hard things about a robot like this is having the concept of people. Like, how does a robot know if there's a person around? That's a hard problem to solve. Um, there's a great set of libraries, uh, collectively known as OpenCV, that do a whole bunch of computer vision sorts of things, uh, but it's, it's written in C for performance reasons and for historical reasons. And I don't want to go and learn all of computer vision theory, and so I don't have to. I can use Spyglass. Uh, thank goodness for Andre Medeiros uh, and the amazing Ruby community that we have. Uh, as an example here, this is uh, an example pulled from their examples directory on the GitHub page for this project. Uh, and you can see that basically we, uh, we create a new video capture, um, and then we use the reverse shovel operator. I don't know if there's like a Devron instead of a Chevron name for this, but basically pulling frames out of the video capture device into a variable, and uh, then you can pass them into a cascade classifier. Don't know what that thing is. Don't understand how it works. I'm a Rubyist. Uh, <laughs> And so um, I just steal this code, and it does work, and it does things, and that's good. <laughs> so another thing that Rubyists are good at, <laughs> uh, apparently sitting awkwardly on a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I really don't understand what this, this little blue person is doing, but it seems somehow inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I thought, um, OK, this, this will help me to look for faces but I have no way of knowing which faces are the Jedi and which faces are the Empire. And I needed some way to be able to differentiate the faces that I was seeing. And luckily, Google Cloud Vision API got announced during the prep for this talk. And thank goodness that it did. Uh, that's, that's why I was able to extend it. <laughs> Good job. Thank you very much, Mike Moore. Uh, I will steal more of your code shamelessly on stage. Uh, so this, this is a really fun API to play around with. If you haven't played around with it yet, it'll do OCR to pull text out of images for you. Um, it'll also look for taggable entities, so it'll notice sailboats and dogs and kittens, probably dinosaurs, but I haven't tested it yet. Aja, she probably already knows. And it does dinosaurs according to Aja, that's good. Uh, and it also does facial analysis, so it does like a sentiment analysis of the faces it sees. So I still can't tell the difference between a stormtrooper who's really happy that they're about to destroy my robot and a Jedi who's really happy because they understand the Force, but as long as you're happy, I know generally some way that I can respond to that. So next thing that Rubyists are very good at, another skill that I can leverage <laughs> is having public opinions. So just as a hypothetical example, some people in this room, we might have opinions about the difference between Minitest and RSpec, <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Uh, and some of us might also have opinions about things like RVM versus RBM, or Vim versus Emacs versus other editors. Um, this seems to be something that we're very good at as a community. So uh, 
I thought, you know, beeping and sort of moving around, those are really great intuitive ways to have an interaction with the robot. Uh, but it would be even better if my robot was more like a Rubyist. So it is. It has a Twitter account. And it will tweet its uh, somewhat trolling opinions of the people that it sees. Uh, and just a, just a minor note here, I do, I do have a good friend named Chris in the audience who I'm pretty sure if I ever posted a picture of him on any sort of social media, it would have to be signed with a GPG key before. Uh, and so it will only tweet pictures of faces that are very close to the camera. So if it scans over the room, it's not going to be like magically getting all your faces. The webcam that it uses is terrible and can't actually see almost anything beyond a few feet. Uh, but if you get real close, like Tyler did, then you get a pretty sweet picture with some sort of, uh, some sort of opinion from a robot posted about you publicly, and that makes you even more of a Rubyist. So the current version of FriendlyBot looks something like this. Unsurprisingly, it looks like a bunch of stuff that got glued and taped together by an amateur, because it is. <laughs> so uh, the basics here you can see, um, the Raspberry Pi is riding on back. It's sitting on top of an external battery. Um, it's totally possible to wire into the battery of the Pi, but then you have to do all sorts of uh, level shifting with your, um, with your power supply, and you have to worry about power surges. And I don't want to worry about all that stuff, so I just buy another battery instead. Uh, it has a really bad webcam, like I mentioned, on the front of it. And uh, at this point, it's probably worth just pausing for a second before my inevitable failure of a demo and pointing out that I just talked about like six small things, and none of them were super complex, and none of them were super in-depth, and all of them were a complete blast. The first time that I actually sent a binary command to this Roomba, uh, was at about 2 in the morning when all of my kids were asleep, and um, I didn't know what the unit of measure was for the speed parameter, <laughs> and so I accidentally told it to drive at half a meter per second, and it goes tearing across the kitchen floor and rips itself out of the plugs that I had wired into the back of it, so I can't send it the stop command, and it's running into things, and I'm <laughs> positive that it's going to wake up everyone in my whole family, and... When I finally wrestled it to the ground and unscrewed its battery to turn it off, I had this feeling of pure joy. <laughs> a little bit different than debugging a production system, but a similar feeling nonetheless. So, uh, since this presentation at this point really can't get any worse, I figure it's time for the demo. Um, let me just do a quick recap of what needs to work in order for this demo to go correctly. Um, a Raspberry Pi has to boot without its SD card becoming randomly weirdo and not booting anymore. So like 10% chance that that goes right. Um, it needs to be able to talk over a serial interface at 115,000 baud to a robot, which is hopefully charged. And it needs to be able to connect to the Wi-Fi. Thanks, guys. Uh, <laughs> And uh, luckily, we're using Hotspot. Um, and then if the Cloud Vision API is also up and relatively responsive, then it should be able to move and take pictures. And if the lighting is OK, then it will even get a decent picture, and it will then tweet about it. So yes, many, many things can go wrong. And it will probably go something like this. <laughs> All right, so here is its Twitter account. I highly encourage all of you to go follow this Twitter account. Hopefully, it will be tweeting here in just a minute. Yes, grounding, grounding, grounding. And dear robot, please work for the love. Huh? that. All right, I'm going to have it come this way so the light's on my face, because the low light is the hardest thing for the camera. Um, MWRC bot. Thank you. That extra light will actually help a lot. So it takes about a minute here for it to get all started up. It has to start a Ruby VM, an Elixir virtual machine, uh, and a few other things, and boot up the camera. And there it goes. And so if I get close, it might play a sound. No! Oh! <laughs> no! <laughs> Try again! Try again, little robot! 
You can do it. (laughs) It did the sound. All right. Random shouting. This is not a Republican debate. What? Someone please help me find my robot later. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go find it. All right. Mike Moore is going to go rescue Friendly Bot. Uh, All right, that went way less terrible than I expected. Uh, And as a result, I have a little bit of time that I can talk through the code of how this thing actually works. Um, I promise not to go into too much detail, but we'll just kind of roll through this stuff one more time. There you go. All right, so um, the first thing, like I mentioned, that I had to do to get this thing to start moving around was send binary commands. There's a really great PDF that the iRobot folks have put out that shows the exact shape of all these commands. It uses standard encodings like like two-byte signed integers and things like that. Uh, And it turns out that Elixir and Erlang have a really great syntax for both parsing and generating uh, that kind of data. And so uh, I decided to, again, it's for fun, so I just wrote it in another language. Uh, and Roombex was born, and you can use that if you want to. Here's an example of what the code looks like. So this is parsing. I get back a single byte that represents the state of all the buttons on the top of the Roomba. There happen to be eight of them. And so I can just say, hey, bring in this one byte and pattern match it and turn byte number zero into clock and byte number one into schedule. And just by setting the sizes, it'll figure out how that lines up and it'll end up giving me back the state of all my buttons as zeros and ones. Uh, So that was a lot of fun. Then I needed something that was kind of stateful that could top of the Roomba. There happened to be eight of the robot and remember, am I supposed to be driving right now or am I supposed to be stopping so I can hopefully get a half decent focused picture. Um, And I uh, named it DJ, of course, after our dear departed friend, DJ Roomba. Um, and so DJ contains the majority of the code in this project. Uh, an example of what DJ does is uh, it receives updates about the sensors. Um, it's checking the sensors 30 times a second. And as it's getting in the sensors, it just does pattern matching to look for common scenarios of this, this bump sensor being pressed or uh, released and things like that, and then changes its driving command. And in that way, it'll just kind of shuffle itself slowly around. It's somewhat painfully slow, but... Uh, Hopefully that makes it easy for it to find faces in the crowd after my talk. Uh, Then what it needs to do is I also wanted to do, as I mentioned, all the OpenCV and the computer vision stuff was going to be done in Ruby. So I did all of that um, using uh, Ruby, but I needed to talk between the two because when the Ruby program sees a face, it needs to say, whoa, whoa, stop for a second because this webcam is terrible and I need to be able to get a half-decent frame of someone's face so I can try to analyze it. Um, And so I did this with just UDP, and so here I'm just listening for some little UDP messages like stop, go, sing, and cancel. And then I needed the code that would look for stuff and decide when to move. (laughs) So uh, here's here's a great piece of code that you can share with your team. Global variables all over the place. (laughs) And uh, also in true Ruby fashion, you know, I figured now's a good time to declare that local variables are dead. It's not something we should be doing anymore. Long live globals. Uh, If no one ever needs to read or understand your code, global variables are a lot of fun. Uh, So here's the main loop of all the Ruby code does over and over. It just basically tells the wanderer to go. That's publishing the little UDP packet. Uh, Then it looks for a face. This is a blocking call that's just sitting in sampling uh, frames. It's able to process about 10 frames a second Uh, only using about half of one of the cores on the Raspberry Pi, which is better than I expected. Um, Then if it finds a face or thinks it sees a good face in the image, it'll stop, um, and then it will try to pick a good frame. And this this one is just doing a more selective, looking for somewhat more focused and looking for a little bit of a bigger face in the frame. 
Uh, and if it finds one that matches those criteria, then it sings a little song and kicks off some asynchronous processing to do the analysis, because I don't want to wait for the internet to be available before I continue moving on and looking for new people. Um, if it doesn't find something, then it plays a sad song, some sad beeps. You guys will probably hear those later in the lobby. Um, and an example, once again, this is pretty much copied and pasted, as I mentioned, uh, from the Spyglass project, and thank goodness for the good work of Andre Medeiros. Uh, and then the analysis basically looks like I pass it to this analyzer object. Um, the analyzer sends it to the Google Cloud uh, and gets back a result. It also checks for some additional blurriness because my local check for blurriness is not very uh, good. And uh, if that all passes, then it decides to actually um, send it to Twitter and it picks a pseudo-random uh, sort of troll to send along with the image. Uh, so, um, so we talked about, and I've spent most of this presentation sort of trolling our community. The things that we're good at are stealing people's code, uh, using things without understanding them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are a few things that I actually think our community is totally outstanding at. And a few examples of those are things like the Friday hug, celebrating our heroes, um, why the lucky stiff has already been mentioned here. But these are people who emphasized uh, whimsy and playfulness and joy. Uh, rather than things like technical excellence and being smarter than other people in the room. Uh, things like Ruby Friends, an entire project and website whose only goal is to try to make groups of Rubyists a little less socially awkward so we can find a way to take pictures with one another. Uh, and hopefully FriendlyBot can be uh, another, another project in that vein uh, that helps Rubyists have a reason to talk to one another at a conference. And finally, uh, this idea of Miniswan. Uh, Tendalove did not give us enough puns, so this is a mini swan. Um, but that's not what mini swan about, is about. It's Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Uh, and this is one of the things that drew me to the Ruby community very early on. Uh, this is a community of people who believes in being welcoming to people who have been neckbearding for 30 years and people who are in the middle of a boot camp and just learning to program. Um, it's a community of people who believes that it's important to be nice and to be kind. Uh, and to me, that... That is why I'm here. That's why I continue to be a part of this community. Um, I think Mountain West has done an amazing job of embodying those values over the last 10 years. Uh, and certainly my own experience, um, you know, I went from being the person who was so intimidated to be bringing a PC to a Mac party at my first UREG, to being someone who was uh, essentially coerced to giving a talk at a UREG, and, uh, and then coerced some more times, and then eventually coerced into giving a talk at Mount West RubyConf. Um, and all along the way, I've been surrounded by good friends and good people who were kind and forgiving of me and of the times that I made mistakes. Um, and I hope that whatever is in our future as a community, uh, whatever meetups and conferences we do this next year and the years after, I hope that that remains at the core of what this community is and what we choose to do with our time and effort. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> I shouldn't repeat it because it's a troll, but I should because it needs to be repeated for future humanity. The question was, did I get a lot of design input on the robot, or was it designed in a vacuum? Um, thank you for bringing it in strong, Aaron. <laughs> All right, any other questions? <laughs> yeah, um, so the question was, did I look at the things like the R2 framework? So um, there's a really good robot-related robot framework called R2 for Ruby. Um, it's made by the same people who make Cylon.js and Gopherbot, I believe, is the one in Go. Um, it's a really cool framework. Um, I did look at it. But I kind of, um, despite the fact that I poked a lot of fun at not wanting to get into the resistors and capacitors and that part of the whole problem, I did like the idea of getting into like, what do these bits and bytes look like as they fly over the wire? And so I was kind of excited about writing that part of the code. And since it, it fit my fancy, I just figured I'd write it myself. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, there should have been another one earlier too. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Look at its legs. <laughs>
<laughs> it's still trying. <laughs> all right, Paul. Um, all right, so the question is, there's limited times. We have families. We have other things. How do I try to time box or find time for doing these kinds of projects? Um, I'd say that I'm, uh, in a big way, a victim of my own interests, um, somewhat like Aja's talk about feeling like a ferret. Um, this just happened to hit me at a time when I looked around, and I had always wanted to build a robot, but um, I, in previous times when I had looked around, I just the, the raw materials that I had to start from were at two layers of abstraction lower. Um, and I, when I looked at it, I thought, oh, that's, that's a thousand-hour project, and there's no way I'm going to get through all of it. Um, this was a time when I looked at it and I thought, oh, I can start from this Roomba thing, I can start from Raspberry Pi. I, I think all said and done, it's, this is probably about 90 to 100 hours of like, coding time and debugging and playing around with it. Um, it's still a significant effort. Uh, the only real way that I organize that is uh, once a week, me and my wife plan out our week, and she tells me what nights she's going to go like, to dinner with a friend or go to her pottery class, and I tell her which nights are programming nights. Uh, and that just sets the expectation that, like, once the kids are in bed, I'm probably going to be a terrible husband until the morning. So uh, we, just, we just plan it out, and that way we, we know what the expectations are. That's, that's all I got. Oh, here we go. This one's really good. You've got to wait for this one. There's a little bit of a buildup. Clear shot. Samba, samba, samba. And then... Uh, so good. <laughs> the little the hip shake is what gets me. Um, so the question was about the image quality. It's just because I'm a total cheapskate. So I, I bought like an $18 webcam off of Amazon. Um, if it was using something even halfway decent, I wouldn't have nearly as much problem with white balance and um, being able to focus quickly and things like that. No, yeah, no, it wasn't an issue at the operating system level or the Raspberry Pi level. It was just with the hardware of the camera that I was using. Yeah, so it actually works a lot better if you, if you stick the laptop on top of it. It just looks a lot less friendly. Oh, GIF, GIF, thank you. Oh, man, this one's good. Simple, but it's good. <laughs> I, don't, I wish we could see the build-up to this, because I don't know what this challenge is, but clearly it failed. Uh, Brandon, did you have something? Um, I, I'm, we take strong bet that in this Wi-Fi, it would be limited by your bandwidth. Uh, when I tested it from a good internet location, it was still taking around like a second and a half. Um, you're, you are still sending an entire image, which is a lot bigger than like a normal JSON payload. Um, and the analysis it's doing is much more complicated than just checking equality or things like that. So it's still, it's, I mean, it doesn't take a long time, but I knew that I was going to be in a somewhat questionable Wi-Fi environment when I demoed, so I planned on the fact that sometimes those asynchronous jobs, they just fail, and so that's fine. Just let them fail and leave an image sitting around on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the question is, did I look into running the Ruby code sort of bare metal without an operating system? So that would be something like a microkernel or something like that is what you're imagining? Um, I didn't really look into that. Like I said, I was, uh, this was definitely just a case of I know I'm not going to get into all the details, so I'll just pick and choose which details I find interesting. Uh, so I, I just didn't really play around with any sort of tuning or, or running microkernels, no. Oh, do I have another GIF? You guys are asking a lot of questions. Oh, man, I'm out. Hold on, we'll just go back to this one. This one is so good. <laughs> all right, enjoy. I'll, I'll just keep answering questions, but you guys can just, you guys can just enjoy that. Um, so what are my plans for the future with Friendly Bot? Um, a few things. I definitely am going to let it have some time just roaming around my house and scaring uh, the heck out of my little baby, like little baby Winston you saw at the beginning. Uh, he's not a big fan of Friendly Bot. Um, <laughs> but this, this is how he gets to know. Like, you know, until they accustomate, it's just they're going to feel that way. So um, I'm probably going to scare my children a little bit. Uh, I, would, I would actually really like to um, add on the ability to recognize faces when it sees the same face many, many times. Um, and I would also really like to get to the point where I have some sort of a locomotion that I can get up and down stairs. Um, and I thought it would be cool if uh, it sort of logged activity of like who spends the most amount of time in various parts of the house. I don't know why that metric appeals to me. Um, I'm a random human being, but for some reason that metric does. Like, I'm curious, do we even use that one bedroom in the corner of the upstairs? 
And uh, if it noticed when it saw faces heading in and out of that area, then maybe I would have a metric for it instead of just telling my wife, no, we shouldn't buy a chair for that bedroom. <laughs> my favorite show featuring a giant robot. Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm really failing you by not having an answer to that question, but I don't really watch any shows with giant robots. <laughs> I don't know. Ask Mike Moore. I know he watches really terrible movies like Transformers and Pacific Rim, so I'm sure he'll have an opinion. <laughs> Does anyone else want to ask a question that I can make fun of Mike Moore as part of my answer? All right, well, um, Friendly Bot will be hanging out over here by the table in this little lounge area. Like I said, it's not going to like creep on people or try to like stalk you. It's just going to be randomly roaming around. And if you happen to crouch down by it, it'll take a picture of you and tweet about it. And then you can retweet it to all of your friends. Uh, or maybe get another Rubius to take a picture with you. You guys get like, you know, maybe we can even, we can get some synergy with Aaron Patterson's selfie stick technology and put it on top of the Roomba. Possibilities are endless, but it will be roaming around out there. And if you're interested in robots, come and talk to me. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>